Okay, so we should be live now, hopefully. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And uh, actually, good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. Um, and welcome uh, to uh, Color Intelligence Headquarters here in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> So, uh, hey, good to see you all, and thank you for joining in. Um, I, I'm so happy that after a while, you know, we are live again, and, you know, that we have actually also something interesting to show you. Um, today, as, uh, you know, title of this presentation says, we are going to be showing uh, the latest update to Look Designer 2.4. So this is going to be an interesting one. You know, this is one of the advantages of, you know, having a software that has an active subscription. You know, this is just for all of those who kind of say, oh, I know, I hate subscription. I don't want a subscription. Well, you see, this is the advantage of it because when you subscribe to software, you're actually, you know, like accelerating development of it. It's just, you know, companies that, you know, work on subscription basis operate completely different than companies that just build software and sell it. You know, our goal is always to make software better and better and just improve it every time. You know, this is basically the game, which is which is why we chose this model. And, and, and as, a, as a result of that, you know, we are really committed to kind of bring more and better, you know, to our application, you know, month after month after month. So, you know, this is actually a release that we are just about to push live. You know, this one's going to go to factory drivers first, and then next week we're going to publish it to everybody else. But actually, so just so you know, we are already working on 2.5 release. We have already started doing that. <laughs> so, you know, it's relentless. It's not happening at all. I want to see, like, as well, who is with us today? So very good. Jeremy is here. Hello. And Thomas. Hello, Thomas. I have something for you. You're going to be liking this, Thomas. This is going to be definitely interesting. Let's see who else. Okay. Victor from Germany and Blake from Munich. Hello, Blake. Good to see you. Blake, we're going to be in touch next week. You know, when, you know, we've just had a, like a little push, you know, by the way, you guys are probably aware of it that we are doing a course with Sempty on color management, you know, but you know, this course is now going to be starting in September, not as planned like next month. We decided to push it back for September, more details about it a little bit later. And then we have someone from Vancouver. Hello. And this Rio, of course. I do not want to have uh, any colorist meetups with someone without someone from Brazil, please. <laughs> and Julian from Ecuador. Julian, I love to see you here. Oh my God, all the people love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And Ghana, oh my God, I love it, I love it. You know, Mojo Jojo, I kind of love that. Okay, and Edgar is here with us. Hello, everybody. Oh my God, good to see you all. Fantastic. Fantastic. So basically, guys, we managed to actually to cram almost 50 new features and improvements to this build of Look Designer. You know, and, and, and you know, we've just taken all of your feedback, all of your requests and actually worked on some other interesting ideas. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, just share with you is, um, you know, a little story, you know, that I just wanted to show you. And this is, a, you know, this gentleman here on this photo that was taken back in 2000 and I think believe 12 or something like that. I believe this has been a while ago. As you can see, I didn't have a beard at that time. <laughs> and um, this gentleman's name, if you don't recognize him, is Vittorio Storaro. And he's probably one of the greatest cinematographer on earth, I would say. Like he's definitely one that's, that's, that's you know, has, has, you know, created some of the most beautiful images. And this is probably what he knows to do the best. He just knows how image should look in order to look good. Like he definitely knows how to make pictures look good. He, he's, he's, he's great for that. But one interesting thing about him is that he's not very technical. He's not necessarily somebody who's like, you know, really like, you know, diving deep into all these pixels and everything and gamuts and so on. So back in the day, I was, um, I had a reputation and I was already working for many, like a large studio projects um, as a person who was able to really, you know, well emulate film on 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 digital cameras and digital cameras were just coming up film was still considered best method you know for shooting what the look was always better on film somehow for cinematographers 
but you know digital cameras were making inroads and around that time I think Aria Alexa got released and Sony made something called F65 and, and Red One was kind of in the game as well. So you know, it, things were just really moving so fast in digital domain that you know this idea that we could shoot digital but still preserve that filmic look was very you know apparent at that time so you know i i i, I had a very sophisticated technology that i started developing almost five six years ago you know of film emulation that i used and and as a part of that you know i got to meet uh, vittorio storaro who came to my studio and what he did is is you know I, I and I wanted of course to impress him and I tried to give him as technical you know and how accurate photometric we measured this and that and blah blah you know I was trying to explain him all this technology you know and then when he listened to me he finished and then he said to me he said to me Dado what you need to do is you need to convert your laboratory into a playground <laughs> And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> so basically, the way how Vittorio put it was this, you know. So, so you know, like a, the color grading studio is actually a wonderful place where one could explore, you know, things when, you know, he, had, he kind of used this terminology, space, motion, time, art. You know, and, 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 and I really agree with him, you know, it's a place, you know, of creation where wonderful things can happen, you know, so, you know, you can take it very technically, you could try to kind of be perfect in emulating film and say, oh, I can make it look exactly like, them. you know, it's absolutely correct, we can do this, but that's not the point. The point is to be playful, to be creative. And you know, the, he said to me, there are two types of artists, ones that are very scientific, you know, that approach this very scientifically, and the other ones that throw all of this away and just play. And really, he belongs to that second category for sure. He's the one, you know, who's playing, who's actually like, you know, trying to invent and create and turn things upside down and figure things out, you know, which is really, you know, Probably one of the reasons, you know, why his images look the way they do is because, you know, he just, you know, has a certain vision and a certain idea to how he wants things to look. And, you know, that definitely st stuck with me, you know, and already, you know, from that moment onwards, I stopped, you know, wanting to be a guy who's always going to be able to make things look perfectly like film. I definitely want to know how film looks, how to make you know, looks that are emulating and looking like film, but I never really felt that this is the end point. The end point is always to make things look as beautiful as we can for the project we work on and actually go beyond just imitating film. Let's start to kind of, you know, use that, you know, emulsion and that feel that we get from it as a starting point and try to put our own personal touch into it and create new looks, something completely unique. And that's a really, you know, the point that, 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 you know, he tried to make, which I kind of, you know, couldn't agree with him more. So what um, I kind of wanted to um, then uh, uh, show you is a little bit the features, of course, that what we did, but I wanted to also to tell you this, that um, this particular build of a look designer is available um, to factory drivers. Uh, today, um, we're going to post the links um, in um, the Discord, and I'm also going to send a mail out to all our factory drivers, and then you guys can start bashing out, out on it and, and testing it. And then for everybody else, what we're going to do is we are going to publish a, um, uh, a release, like as soon as, you know, this kind of, you know, you know testing period with factory driver has finished, I hope as early as next week. Um, and, you know, this is going to then, you know, we're going to update a little bit our website as well and put some more training courses and stuff like this. So hopefully, you know, this is all going to help you. So general release of this is going to be live um, early next week. But in, in the meantime, if you do want it desperately, if you go like, hey, I really have a project, I need it to start, start testing it now, we can accommodate those requests. Just email help at colorlab.ai and Marcello or Ian are going to be able to help you with that and be able to, you know, send you the license. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the plan for us. So now let's start really to kind of go and, and understand what are the new features. Um, I am deliberately going to use an image that I used last time. I was actually, you know, doing in a similar presentation because, um, you know, I wanted you to see the difference really between the two. And actually, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to go like and show you, um, you know, uh, 
all the way from the top until the end. You know, what is everything new? And then we're going to do some practical stuff, and I'm going to show you really how to utilize these new features. I can just also see that in uh, 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 Mohan asked the question, hey, do I need to pay for upgrade? No, you don't. This is all free. There is no paid upgrades for you know, Look Designer. It's the Look Designer. And, you know, your subscription is your upgrade. So you just basically enjoy it, my friend. No problem. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing to worry about. Uh, OK, there is no Instagram account for Look Designer, but there is an account called Color Lab AI. And also, you can see a lot of uh, people who use Look Designer at our uh, color training account, um, you know, and actually we've been running like for the past month or so a series where we were like showing and showcasing some of the most amazing colorists that have been working with us and training with us and actively using Look Designer so you can actually see some of the, you know, remarkable results that these people produce, um, you know, so just, you know, go over to an Instagram to color training or, you know, check out Color Lab AI Instagram account. OK, so here we go. Let's see if any more questions before I start. Uh, uh, I'm on, uh, in the middle of a project. Uh, yes. OK, so the good news is this. So what is happening is this. This one is a new installer. So when you install 2.4, it is going to be just a new plugin. It's not going to overwrite 2.3. So you know we stopped doing that from like 2.2 release or something like that. So every new point release that is not compatible with the previous one is going to be a new installer. So that way it's not gonna you know, play havoc with your old project. So you can totally install it even though you're in the middle of the project. Of course, I wouldn't necessarily replace it, right? But you know, I, you can still test it and it's not gonna affect your previous plugin. So this is just another you know, important thing. And Borislav Konstantinov is at, hello Borislav, good to see you. So let me start basically all going, giving an overview to what's new and, and, and how things are working. OK, so I'm going to start here at the top. And, and here is a really where a lot of work went into. And this is all the camera profiles. So we did a, quite a bit of work here. So now I believe we have all the combinations for Blackmagic camera. So we have a Gen 1, Gen 3, Gen 4, and now also Gen 5. OK, we have a native Gen 5. So if you are going to be shooting with a new firmware for Pocket, you know, in ProRes, then you know you're going to be able to work directly with it. So we thank you, Blackmagic, for providing us with that Gen 5 color science. Then we have expanded our Canon, you know, profiles. You know, so we what we have is a Canon Log 709, then we have a Log 2 709, Log 3 709, and then we have a, all three versions also for Cinema Gamut. So Canon Cinema, Cinema Log, Log 2, Log 3. So that is also like a, you know, uh, so now I, I think it was Daniel or somebody who was asking for it. And now also we have a Jens Harms as well who's using a lot of Canon. So I hope you know that they are going to be happy now with all of these IDTs being added for them. <laughs> OK, the next thing then we have is, of course, we have a DaVinci white gamut, which is what we are using when we are color managing using DaVinci. Then we have a, a DJI. We, we had it just as a reminder, guys, we also have a film scan. If you're working with original film scans, there is an input for that. Now, this one is very interesting, and it's particularly, I had it, um, you know, Thomas Dalai in, 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 in my kind of mind when I was creating this. What we did now is we added all Filmic Pro options that you have. So what you're going to get now is this, is you're going to get like a Filmic Flat, you know, Filmic, you know, Hybrid Logama version 3, Filmic Log version 2, and Filmic, Filmic Log version 3. So all of those are now available to you guys, and you can go and start using any of your Filmic footage. Um, then I, we have added, uh, we had already iPhone Dolby, you know, HDR. This is the new iPhone 12. When it shoots in the HDR mode, we just added to it an iPhone 12 SDR. So in case you're working with SDR, we build a separate IDT, like, you know, just using our measurements. Now here is for, you know, an interesting one. It's called Kinelog 3, and you guys probably know what this is. And I want to thank Ian for helping me out with this one. So yes, I actually find already that so many people ask for this profile, you know, so I can't believe we didn't have it. So actually, you know, it's in now. It's all here. 
Um, then what we added as well is we added an option for you to be able to import your HDR masters. So if you have a HDR10 master, you have already graded it and finished it. Now you can bring it back in and you can repurpose it for other stuff. So you basically have now ability to bring full Rec 2020 PQ1000 masters. Um, now there is an interesting profile. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it too. It's called Red IPP DV. Uh, stand, DV stands as my initials, of course. You know what it is, is 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 I have been you know seriously struggling with some of the you know color that I was getting you know just with a straight IPP two when it comes to skin tones, when it comes to fidelity of primarily color. I'm super happy the way how Red's handling you know the tonal response of IPP two and log three G ten. But I have had like a real issues. I really kind of felt that skin was kind of falling off the track a little bit. So, you know, I made a, an IPP2 version of IDT for that that is actually going to really help you guys. It's really going to handle some of the color stuff that I believe Red should have addressed. You know, they have a situation that their triangle, their color space is, is you know, actually very abstract. You know, it goes well outside of the kind of visible spectrum. And that really causes problems when we start moving it from one color space to another. So what we're doing is we, we're dealing with that in a slightly different manner. There is a new one, you know, there is a new one for that. Um, okay, the next thing then what we got is we also gave you like an option to import sRGB material, you know, so that's maybe like, you know, you have some still images that are sRGB or something like that. And for my friends who work in gaming industry and visual effects, we have added an import for linear EXR. So now you can actually just, you know, drop a linear EXR as long as it's an sRGB, which is but primarily what, you know, film, what kind of VFX guys are using. You can go straight from linear into whatever other color space you want. And yes, the Z cam is supported now as well. So I believe like, you know, we covered, you know, I think every possible, you know, camera, okay, there we didn't cover every possible, there's always one more we didn't, right? <laughs> there's always going to be another one. But, you know, as I said, we're working hard and trying to get all of those in. Uh, okay, um, Justin asked the question, I have a Color BI Pro license. Yes, you're going to get in your download, in your Pro license, when you go to your page, you're going to see a download for a plugin and license for a plugin. So you can just download it. A, a Color Lab AI Pro license get all the plugins included in their subscription. And this one particularly, unless you're a factory driver, you're not gonna get it immediately. Justin, you're gonna get it as hopefully as early as next week. As soon as the another round of testing has gone through, we're gonna push it live. Yes. So, uh, y well, you know, I don't. I think there is a. You cannot say better or worse. You know, someone said this is better than DaVinci Color Management. You know, there is no better. There is. It's just a slightly different color management. You know, it's just a slightly different way of dealing with color. You know, whether it's better for you or not, it's quite, You know, depends really on your workflow. But I think it's a great alternative to what we have at the moment, and we are certainly going to be continuing improvement because color management is most essential and starting point for look creation. Unless we sort it out, we can't really fix it. And the reason why we don't stick to standards like ACES or, or you know, like use DaVinci RCMs is because we do want to have a granular detail into some aspects of color management in order to improve some elements and parts that are, you know, that we found are not necessarily functioning in the best way. So every kind of type of color management has got its advantages and disadvantages. And we are just trying to be like in this neutral space where we can actually mold our, you know, image processing to, you know, the way how we feel, you know, images are going to perform in the best way. Okay, now let's go and move now to the next one, which is the output profiles, right? So we have, we got all of this idea, what we had already, we also had the film skin, of course, the new one is now linear. So now you can go actually into the linear space out. So again, this is for our you know, visual effects guys. The new one as well that I added is called Mac Pro P3D65. So this is very particular for users who are working in Mac Pro environment, right? So if you have a, like a ability to view your images in P3D65, on the Mac display and you also want to show it on your iPad Pro and you want to be able to take advantage of that, you know, wider color space, 
this is the profile for you. So now actually you could work natively in P3 and it's really fantastic as long as you're staying in that controlled, you know, uh, Catalina Big Sur environment because you will be tagging images with P3D65 and they will be then color managed for other displays, yet you will maintain like a really beautiful, you know, wider P3 gamut, you know, so I think it's actually really good alternative. P3D65 SDR is different. That is to be used for on-set monitoring. Um, so for example, Roger Deakins is monitoring everything on set exactly in this color space. It's this kind of P3D65 with 709 gamma with 2.4 gamma. Um, some other cinematographers choose to calibrate all of their set in P3D65 and use that as their monitoring. So in case you're working on projects, you know, like those, you know, you are going to be able to use this as an out output device transform. And then we have a two versions of a DCI. I added a one which is called, um, you know, P3DCI CI that stands for color intelligence. This one is, is using P3DCI settings, but without a white point adjustment. So that's basically, you know, as you know, PCDCI has got a D60 white point, but we don't include the white point here simply because there is a little shift that happens with the primaries for that. And, you know, we did not want to kind of, you know, bother with it. We know that some of our customers are, you know, using, you know, their own workflows, you know, to convert into X, Y, Z and so on. And this is a basically a, pro a profile for them. This is really just guys, if you're going to projector, cinema projector or DCI. I wouldn't worry about it otherwise. And then we have a standard P3 DCI, you know, which is, you know, based on a, stand a standard. It has all of that white point included in it. Now, what we got now is a several Rec 709 versions. And you go like, how is that? Can you have, how come you have? Well, we can, and we, it's okay to have it. And you should be able to be free to choose whatever 709 works better for you, okay? The default 709, the one that says 709 ODT that I have selected now, it's based purely on SAMPTI standard. So this is you know, what SAMPTI you know, is, 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 is stipulating how you know, this you know, color space should work. And it's probably the most kind of neutral and universal space out there, right? Then what we have is we have one which is called Rec 709 by Ari. It's slightly different, right? It's it Ari is using specific tonal and gamut mapping to come to their 709. And we actually, you know, have just adapted that as well. And what you can do now, which is really nice, is you can use this Ari 709 on other cameras, for example, on red. And it's another great step how you can improve, you know, some skin, uh, uh, skin tonal responses of red as well. So it's a, it's a great trick, you know, you should definitely look into that. Then I have another one which is called 709 by CI. This is one that is used, that we designed, and it's really there to give you the maximum, you know, transform without, you know, trying to impose any restrictions to, you know, particular tonality, okay? So as you can tell, the difference between 709 by Ari and 709 by color intelligence is that we are not limiting gamut in that way. And that actually is going to give you a cleaner result, very clean results. But, you know, you're going to need to manage, you know, gamuts in, in, differently. Now, if you are using film profiles, this is probably a better way how to do it. But again, through experimentation, remember beginning, a playground, let's go and play, let's figure out what's going to work better. You can then decide which one of those is going to have a better image for you. And you know, these ODTs have a significant impact on your image. They are not trivial. You know, the choice of this ODT is actually really important. You know, they, they are incredibly, you know, they, they give your character to your image to the great part, you know, they are the starting point. So choosing the right ODT is not just a matter of like, you know, a random choice. You really have to, you know, play and decide which one's going to work better for you. Then I have a one which is called Rec 709 by RCM2. This is the Da Vinci's new color management, Resolve Color Management 2, and they have a slightly different Rec 709 as well, okay? But in case you work in color managed with Da Vinci, you want to have the same output coming out of the plugin as you are having coming out of your, your, your color management. So, you know, we had to include it in order to give you better precision. So this is also another one just in case, you know, you need to do that. And then I have included two new profiles. They are REC 2100 Hybrid Logama and REC 2100 PQ1000. 
and really, um, you know, they're inspired, you know, by um, Walter Volpato, you know, and, and, you know, I had, a, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, like a long chat with him. And, you know, we've been discussing amongst other things, some HDR. By the way, we're going to make an interesting announcement coming soon. I don't want to spill beans too early. But what, what Walter has a very particular approach to HDR. And I get it. I totally understand, you know, how he works and why he works like that. And I can tell that definitely, like, you know, I can feel that there's two schools of how to create HDR. You know, there is one that, you know, maybe you've seen, like, you know, from people like, you know, that use ACCCT, you know, where they're mapping everything to full thousand nits. And then there is approach like, you know, Walter has that makes like, you know, uh, HDR be very close to SDR just with the higher kind of, you know, with slightly higher luminance values. It's a little bit brighter in the highlight, but you know, the body of an image, you know, the gray and, you know, your, your, your diffuse whites, they actually are pretty consistent. So these two outputs, you know, uh, REC 2100 PQ1000 and REC 2100 HLD is exactly what Walter Volpato would do, how he would map his SDR to HDR, not trying to push it into turbo mode, but actually just giving it like a, you know, gorge, just like, you know, like a lift off in the highlight. If you have any, like, you know, particular, like, you know, peaks, like, you know, some sort of, you know, highlights, you know, they will show up. We're not going to limit them, but, you know, you are not trying, you're trying to kind of visually bring your HDR and SDR, you know, to an interesting parallel. And that's, a, I feel, a valid, you know, approach to HDR. And we definitely wanted to do this for you. We wanted to give you an option that in case you want to work like that, you have profiles that are just going to accelerate it for you. And then, of course, we have an output for red, white, gamma, RGB. This is when you want to export LUTs that you want to load in red camera. You need to use this profile. And then there is also an sRGB ODT. So for all of us who have to deliver to internet only, let's say I'm just working and this is going to be my internet only job. And you probably guys, you know, have you know, heard of this problem with QuickTime gamma issue when things don't look the same, I render them in this browser, I upload them in here, and then, and then they don't look the same in QuickTime. Well, you know, this particular sRGB ODT, as long as you tag your QuickTime says 111, is going to give you the highest consistency amongst different devices. So, you know, I always get asked that question, oh, Dado, what should I do? How should I export things that, you know, they look consistent, that they look, this is the profile that's going to give you the highest consistency. Not absolute, there is still going to be fluctuations, but you're going to be closest on VLC, on QuickTime, inside the browser, and so on on YouTube. You know, this, this particular profile is for that. So as you can tell, like, you know, we've done quite a bit of work, you know, to kind of help you guys, you know, to give you like a variety of options, you know, that you really need in order to be able to get, you know, all these outputs that you need. Yes, the Z log from is now supported, absolutely. Then there is another comment, uh, absolutely wonderful. Hey, thank you. <laughs> there is another Cinema DLG. I have to see like who's using Cinema DLG. This is probably just for those DJI cameras. Maybe we can see what it's like. I don't, I'm open now. Now that we are putting profiles in, we might as well put them all in, no problem at all. Okay, great. So the next thing then I wanna go is, is to talk to you about another thing. And this is, you guys have to thank to um, Roberto Negron for this uh, here. We, he asked, let's guys bring the printer lights back, please. And Roberto was right. He kind of really recognized that what we have is a slightly different way our printer lights respond. And the reason why they respond differently is because they are more linear they're, they work more as, um, you know, uh, exposure does. They don't work in the same way how the printer lights work in Da Vinci. And, you know, Roberto has noticed that. And, and, and we originally took it out in 2.3, just trying to simplify interface. But, you know, like he kind of said, hey, I really needed this as an important tool for me. So, yes, we brought it back. So uh, this kind of, you know, good exposure, you know, style printer lights are here. Live gum again, nothing changed. Subtractive color, you guys know there's nothing changed there. Um, what then we got here is we're coming then to negative options. So there is some new stuff here. Okay, let me show you here what's happening. So we have a negative stock, you know, that we had before, but I ha want, really wanted to improve in this, okay? And I show you why. So if I, for example, now, like, let's say I switch now a negative stock that is, you know, from Agfa or, you know, some, let's say, you know, I'm, I can use any one of them, right? 
What I do find is that especially if I increase their intensity, I'm actually really, you know, getting a high volume of saturation. In. And the reason why that's happening is because our, what we did is we have mapped this, you know, native uh, film color space to Alexa white gamut. And of course, you know, like it just behaves like in a such a way, has like a, you know, like a, a, a little bit higher volume now, right? So I wanted to kind of go back to the drawing board and bring some of those film stocks in more on its native kind of you know, stage without neutralizing them completely and adapting them. So um, what I did now is I created a new profile which is called a negative stock gen two. And you're going to notice straight away the difference, you know, that they behave closer to the original stock, you know, it's, I think of it just a different approach to, to, to profile, you know, uh, film scans. And basically what we good now is a new ACFA, you know, we have an ACFA which is 250 ISO now. Um, then we have an ectochrome, you know, um, version. Then we have, um, uh, you know, two Fujis, but wait until I show you this one. And you've been waiting for this one. It's the Kodak 5213, watch this, boom, I mean, I, this is exactly <laughs> the reason why I wanted to include this particular pack primarily because of this 5213, you know, I just don't know this particular, you know, profile just works so wonderfully. Like it's this kind of epitome of orange and teal, you know, that Kodak used to create. And, and, you know, you guys are absolutely going to love it. I mean, it's just really, really good. You know, I have got, you know, more of those. I know you guys are going to see the, the, these profiles are actually, you know, working incredibly well. I already have been playing with it, you know, and I absolutely love it. But I'll stick to 5213 because it's definitely my favorite at the moment, right? <laughs> okay, so the next thing I'm going to do, but before I do that, let me just go and switch uh, my uh, camera off so that you can see the bottom, the bottom of my screen. So there we go. Um, so then what we got here is we have then updated our print options as well. Okay, so what are, what's happening here? So you can see that we still have uh, all of those F12345, you know, so they are all here, you know, all of these, you know, contrast curves are there as, you know, you were used before. But one thing we did is we have definitely improved 2393. So the reason why we wanted to do this is because um, we actually, you know, consulted, you know, um, you know, some of our colleagues, you know, who work a lot with that stock, who have a real life experience. And what they advised us is this. 2393, when it's scanned, which is the profiles that we had, definitely looked the way we had it. But that is not the way how we would have left it. You understand? Because what you do is you are actually applying certain amount of printer lights in order to actually change this. And also you have to understand what Kodak had to do with that stock. They had to change a little bit their color science, you know, because first they had a negative stock that had a you know, more dynamic range that Synanlog was able to do. Then, then also, like, you know, when they released this stock, they really wanted to get you know more contrast and higher saturation of color but in order for you to get it you didn't just use the standard printer light setting you would play you know in order to bring that image to the level you wanted so what we did is we applied it post processing because i found that that contrast we had was almost unusable you know it worked great for some hdr projects but i just really wanted to bring this 2393 and you know now we're there because it just gives me like a really that that kind of great like a like a 2393 profile which i remember seeing you know now, I still need it then a contrast that is going to be very punchy, something that's just going to punch, you know, above the weight and say yes, when you need something very crunchy. So what we did is we created a new S profile, which is called S3. So you see, if I now click on S3, this is almost like in style replacing the old 2393, right? This is the one that is, you know, changing that. Um, and, and, and this is basically one that I would say, you know, you can use when you really want to have like a, you know, some punchy contrast. So, so the new S3 is going to be replacing that. I'll go back to 2393 as such. Now also, I know we had a little bug, you know, that our bypass print options wasn't switching off the print, you know, profiles and now contrast profiles. So this is now fixed. It's working absolutely fine. 
Um, another thing that, that we got is we have expanded our print options, okay? So we have now much wider options here. So there is the standard ones, the, the generic one. Then we have a CP3510, which is the old school, you know, Fuji print. Um, then we have a 8503, which is also another, you know, print stock. Then I have a, a new version of 3510. You know, this one, you know, is just a slightly different measurements I got from another facility. And then I want to thank um, to my friends from Japan, you know, that who have been so kind to submit their, um, you know, tests that they did on scans. Um, I don't know when this was done, probably a few years ago. Um, but actually, I found that these particular, you know, Japanese styles of Fuji were actually, you know, looking amazing. And you see, especially in this combination with DT213, you know, this is giving me absolutely gorgeous results. So thank you, Japan, for, you know, contributing to this project. The next thing then I want, I have is like a, the standard, you know, my Kodak 23, you had already 83 and 93. And then we brought back those profiles we had in the original version two that we then took out, if you remember, right? So basically, you know, this is the, this is the one that, 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 you know, you ask for, you know, I, don't, I forgot now like somebody, you know, on, on, on Discord asked me for this, hey, you know, I'm getting such a good results with this one, where are they gone? Fine, we brought them all back in. So now you have a whole range of options when it comes to 2083. So you have an average 2383. Like this is basically combination of like measurements over the time. And then we would took all these numbers and we averaged them and we said, okay, this is, should be like a, an average number of like, you know, about more than 20 measurements of the profiling. Then we have a classic one. You know, the classic really has this role of this is really, you know, I call it classic because it's, it's one I created back in 2009. You know, that was my very first profiling I did with a company called Rising Sun Research in Australia. And interestingly, the guy who did the profiling back then um, is now a color, chief color scientist at uh, Black Magic Design, Michael. So I actually, like, you know, it was probably him who kind of scanned and profiled this stock for me. Um, then we have a 2383 Generation 2, which is kind of just a, um, you know, like a slightly adapted version. It's relatively new. Um, then we have a, an old school one, you know, like a, this was basically given to me by a servicing company in Germany that was, you know, you know fixing, you know, some uh, printing. You know, the Ari first had the film printers, you know, and, and I think they were profiling them, you, you know, back then like this. And it looks really different. I actually think that highlighted they were rolling off. I think back in the day, there was not digital projection. So you actually didn't have a, you were not forced to kind of, you know, make this kind of look so like, you know, pop as a digital. So I think you can see that aesthetically it was slightly differently profiled. Then we have a modern one, you know, like as well, you know, which is kind of recent. I think we got it done last year. And then, and I have another version of 2393, just in case, you know, this is the one very high saturated, you know, if you're looking for those, you know, big looks, you know, like big color, you know, big density, you know, this is probably, you know, one for you. So there we go. I'm going to maybe stick with, with, with modern. And as I said, we fixed this option now that you can just, when you switch this on and off, you know, you can really get the contrast and color, you know, working the way it is. Post-processing hasn't changed. You know, I can still just go and introduce my FPE a little bit if I want it. But I kind of, you know, want to show you like now what is really probably the biggest news. Okay, I know I was going all the way from the top to the down. And then I want to actually, you know, give you what it is. You see, what is happening is like, you know, making a wonderful look is one thing. But making this wonderful look behave as an amazing show lot is a completely different thing. Okay, so what you really have to do every time, you know, and I've, and I've, and I trained, you know, this, you know, always in our color management classes. And, you know, when you're making show lot, you have to make sure that this show lot is technically correct because it needs to, you know, work with a variety of different material. And if you have any, you know, problems with it, it's just gonna, you know, sometimes introduce error that are not necessarily even visible to the eye, but somehow can introduce distortion and you wanna avoid that. And I always thought this way of us putting test images, but you know, I also find myself avoiding that process sometimes just because I wanna work very fast and I kind of don't want to be bothered loading a test images and test scanning them, blah, 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 blah. So what I decided to do now is to bring those test images in 
So that all you have to do is you just have to click on a button, like for example, I just clicked on tone map button, and immediately I get the tonal image in the right color space, right, with the right ODT, and now I can basically get it. Dennis Belinsky, thank you so much. You're the, we have to thank you for you know, me bringing those things back because it was you, I just remembered, you were the one who asked for those and you had the problems with it. And I said, yes, Dennis is right, we're gonna do this. So Dennis, thank you, I think everybody has to thank you for that. Okay, great. So you see, now what you do, you just basically, and you know this is so easy that I can just quickly, you know, put the tunnel map on it, but look what's the advantage now as well. Because now, for example, look, I can see that my, that my um, you know, like a, a, a gray, you know, my, my 400 gray has moved, right? I can then go to push and pull, right? And I can correct it and I can see exactly interactively where this sits. You know, I can say, okay, this is roughly where it's going to sit. And now I know that my look that I have created has not impacted the tonal response of original source material. You see, because this is one thing, you wanna have a show that, that is not gonna screw over exposure and everything and contrast that cinematographers adjusting. It is only, you know, improving it. And then now all you have to do is just click on one button and you see where you are. Okay, let's continue. So I think this is incredibly important. And I find myself now that I'm doing that, actually I'm really able to fine tune my, my, my looks like that. But this is not all. Saturation ramp, you know, this is what I call the moment of truth, right? You know, you really want to go and see how well and how clean your images are. And the saturation ramp is basically going from on the top, completely desaturated to fully saturated here at the bottom. And it looks like, you know, like this on your scopes, you know, and you can then see what is happening with your image. And you can see also how well distributed the whole gamut is, because you see, I can see that every pixel is covered, you know, we, because we have a, like this tonal kind of, you know, distribution around the vectorscope and we know what's happening. And why is this important? Actually, I wanted to show you, look, for example, I want to show you the difference between FPE, look what happens. Now if I'm using an FPE, look how it's reducing, in what way it's reducing my gamut, you see? Or now I'm going to use saturation. So look how saturation differently impacts. So you see saturation impacts every single pixel proportionally, where about FPE is affecting only the high saturated parts, is only limiting the gamut. So now you can actually almost visualize what's happening. Another thing that this is going to help you as well, that sometimes, you know, it's, it's you know, look designer, you can 100% push to break the image. You can 100% do that. And, 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 but you, you need to know that you're doing that. You need to, so now you can just flash, for example, saturation ramp. And let's say I, I'm now going to go and, and you know, push, my, uh, push my, let's say, print to extreme, but this is very clean. Let me see, I have some other ones that are not so clean. So for example, maybe I think the old school one is a little bit, you know, kind of, so let's see what's happening if I put the old school one. Oh, there we go. So look, look at how I'm starting. I don't know whether this is gonna show up on YouTube for you, ah, it does, it does. So check it out. You see now how I'm able to see that if I'm using my old school profile to the maximum, right, you see how it's gonna start introducing banding. This is the problems we have with interpolation, with processing, whatever. So what you do then is you then just go and you back it off. And you say, well, actually, you know what? I don't want to push it as much as that. I only wanna leave it as little, you know, as, 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 as much as this, you know, just to minimize any of that distortion. And then you look at it, okay, my image still looks very good. You understand, you know, you basically are, funny enough, you know, you guys see, actually, it's not gonna make a, you know, this fine tuning is more visible inside, you know, the test images, but actually your original look is not going to change drastically so much. It's actually going to like, you know, give you just an idea. Hey, I want to make sure that my LUTs are perfect. They don't have any distortions. They don't have anything like that. Another important test for lights is the lightness ramp, right? So you want to see what is happening with my highlight. And as I can tell, my highlight is beautifully rolling off but here in the shadow, I still have like a, you know, a little bit more banding. So I can actually fix this also like this, you know, so I can maybe just, okay, now I just reduced it a little bit more. I got it to work like that. The other option as well, and this is one 
setting here um, that I have to credit Josh Pines for. It's probably one of the simplest things, but you know, those simple things are the best. And this is one thing that Josh asked me for, and he told me about it. <laughs> and even he said, damn it, why did I never patent that? Because it's an absolutely fantastic thing. And actually, I have to tell you, another person who has a similar slider is also in his Colorfront software. Bill Feitner has got a similar one as well. So what it does is this. So now I build my, it's called the global blend, okay? What global blend does is this, guys. Look, I can now blend between my Rec 709 and my LUT. And it's magical, actually, what happens when you just kind of, you know, go and find a little in between those two. And that is also an incredibly important part when you see like now, look, let me show you. So my kind of in my lightness ramp, I was still able to see some bending here in the shadow. Then all I had to do is I had to take my global band, notch it off a little bit, just a bit, and now it's clean. You see, I got it all to look like perfectly clean. I open it up and bang, here is my look. And actually, guys, this look is not far from what we originally started, right? This is not what we originally started. You know, it, 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 it is just helping you fix some of the issues that are not necessarily visible to your eye. You want to, you know, take these edge case scenarios. Maybe there's going to be a, someone with red bright jacket in. There's gonna, you know, you really want to, you know, ensure that you stress test your LUT that it's actually really going to behave like that. And now that you just have to press one button, you know, just to get and see what's happening, it's going to be, you know, very easy for you to do it. And there is no excuse to be lazy not to test your show LUTs before you finish them. Now it's basically, you know, let's go and make sure that everything you create with Look Designer is technically also accurate and sound that, you know, you are really people who can generate the best show LUTs in the world because you have a tool to do so. Okay, and then we're coming to the last one, but actually definitely not the least, one of my absolutely favorites. A few years ago, um, after he shot Carol, um, I met Ed Luckman, you know, an amazing character. And what a guy, you know, from New York, like super, you know, amazing director or cinematographer, right? Um, and um, he created something, you know, I'm going to send you, post your link. It's called Ed Lachman zones, okay? And what he proposed is very interesting and I totally applaud to him for making this initiative and I really hope that more people are gonna, you know, adopt this um, and what he supposes is this. Look, I'm going to now switch the Ed Lachman zones and it's gonna be self-explanatory. Okay, let me show you this. So Ed Lachman zones are different than any other false color or anything out there because they work in stops, okay? You have to understand that everything we have normally, like, you know, in all of these, you know, zebras and all of this, they're all using standard gamma and IRE, okay? So you basically are working on some linear scale. But that's not the light. The light doesn't behave linearly. It's not linear, okay? Light is, 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 is in log, is in stops, log base of two to be precise, right? So where, where, how you want to analyze your image is in stops, really. And the way how this works is like this. So what I can, when it's gray, you see here I have a gray image, okay? That is your zero exposure. That is your neutral gray. That is your 400 line on a, on a, on a like a 10-bit code value in log C really. Anything that goes stop up is yellow and a two stops up is orange. And the same way is when you go downwards, you know, everything that is light green is stop less and dark green is two stop less and then blue is three stops less and so on and so on and so on. You have a range of six stops from top to bottom, where is your neutral gray is gray. And the higher you go, like, you know, the more orange and red things get, and the lower you go, the more green, blue, purple things get, okay? And it's absolutely fun, that wonderful tool, because let's say now I have built this show LUT. Let's just assume, let me show you how you really wanna use this, right? 
And now I want to now see how this show that is going to work, let's say, on this image, right? How is this going to look now on this image here? All right? So look, what I can do now is I can then just go and show my, first of all, my Ed Lachman zones, and I can tell, oh my God, the cinematographer, this is like also where you can tell who's a good cinematographer, who's not, because every time out of the box, you put without applying anything to it, and as long as you were accurate with your show light, as long as you kept your neutral density of your show light neutral, you're going to see, oh, her face is in gray, so now that is good, she's a but she's a little bit more green here. That means she's a little underexposed, right? So what I can do, I can just nudge a little bit offset, and I want to bring her a little bit highlight. So you see, I want also her face to have some highlight, not to be too dark. And all I'm using is just the, using Ed Lachman zones. And I go like, okay, perfect. Now I think I gave her face, because you want face to be lit that has a dark parts and bright parts. You want to give all the dynamic range in. Right? So now I go and say, okay, you disable it, and bang, I have actually adjusted the exposure correctly for this shot. <laughs> you know, I can actually go and balance all of my material just using a Lachman zone, so literally. Like, so let me show you. So I can just go and say, all right, you know, so I'm going to go and apply this here. Again, amazing. You know, this is where you really, I mean, I, I love, you know, cinematographers that just, you know, know what they're doing. So you see now, perfect, like, you know, I'm gray now around her face. That means that's what I'm looking at. That's where my zero is supposed to be. Fantastic. Okay, let's move on. You know, I'm just going to go and disable it now. Let's see what it looks like. Great. And you see, all I did is just did a little exposure adjustment, but that was just right amount to understand what really cinematographer wanted to do. Because you would imagine the cinematographer would, would always expose person and the face exactly to where the neutral is supposed to sit. Right? This is so easy now to do. It's like, you know, you can get, you know, without even having to speak to the cinematographer, you can get very quickly to the neutral place, you know, to where you want to be. And the secret is because we work in stops. We don't work in IREs. We work in stops. So like perfectly here, I could tell she's underexposed, right? She's in the shadow. So we need to bring her up. I can actually do this a little bit with gamma as well. So I'm just going to go and open gamma. Now you see I have more gray in her face, OK? Now let's go and disable Ed Lachman zone. Let's see how that's going to work. Fantastic. I brought her face now to look exactly the way it is, you know? So, you know, this is absolutely amazing. You know, like I think, you know, I, I, I think, guys, you're going to love it. Another really great benefit is this. If you guys have done your homework, you tested your show lot, like I just did earlier, made sure there's no distortion, what is going to happen is that that same show lot is going to behave incredibly well on a variety of material. And this is usually the best test for your show lot. You know, let's say you build an amazing show lot, you think this is absolutely the one, but your job is not done. First you go, you test it technically, and then you go and you apply it to shots from interior night, exterior night, day, you know, uh, interior day, all sorts of different lighting scenarios, and your light must hold it. And that's really why you did all of this testing, because as long as your exposure is correct, and you're using a Lachman zone to make sure that you adjusted your exposure, you are going to be able with a single lot to actually like perfectly well, you know, get everything looking nice because, you know, this is that homework. This is the kind of thing that you guys have to do in order to get, you know, you know, show that to be a really show that not just some sort of slap look you applied. Now look here, I can tell, okay, I have a problem. I'm overexposed on her skin. You see, I'm all yellow and orange. So let me go and bring some of that down. Perfect, and then maybe I need to bring, okay, now I have a little bit gray on her face. I'm just gonna go a little bit more. Now you see her face has got some gray here. Okay, let's go and disable Ed Lachman zone. Fantastic, bang. Things are just basically, you know, working absolutely fine, right? So this is kind of, you know, just in a nutshell to, you know, what I, 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 I created, you know, like, a, or, you know, I really want to thank all our developers, you know, who have, you know, helped with this. I want to thank you guys, first of all, because, you know, without you not being active members of our community in, on Discord and, you know, pushing me to do more and, and, and actually inspiring me, you know, I have to tell you, like, every day I would wake up, you know, 
and would go first to color training Instagram and would watch another one of your works, you know, and I would go like, oh my God, amazing how great you guys work would just kind of give me motivation to get out of bed and go and do something even better. And I want you to play. I want you all to convert your grading studios into playgrounds. I want you to basically, you know, be the most creative people out there who can make absolutely, absolutely amazing looks that actually no one can really recreate just by using lip gum again and all sorts of stuff like this. Trust me, you know, there are people who think like I can dial all of this with my controls you can maybe get close to it, but this fine detail of adjustment that we do in this plugin is absolutely impossible to do in just using your standard controls or whatever else you want to do. There is not, and by the way, you can just leave it like this. It's all parametric. You know, you can work with the plugin or you can export the LUTs the way you want to, you know, do it. You know, it's all absolutely, absolutely out to you, right? So this is kind of this part I wanted to cover. I also, guys, wanted to tell you that, um, I have another interesting um, uh, uh, you know, thing I wanted to finish for today. I can see that I haven't got um, you know, like a, a, a more time left. We wanted to do one hour. But we, before we finish, I would like you to watch um, a factory driver video from Kyle Kelly. You know, he's a cinematographer you know, who completely changed his approach to color. And I really hope that there is more cinematographers amongst you out there listening right now who can actually like, you know, see how Kyle changed his approach to color and how he's working with it. I honestly believe that, uh, you know, cinematographer of the future is going to have to have skills that Kyle demonstrates here, that actually the beauty of image is going to happen in post, in these show lights, in these techniques that we are doing here. And, and, you know, I only want to welcome more, you know, people like Kyle Kelly to join your colorist community. Don't worry if it's colorist, it's, it's people who love beautiful images, you know, don't be scared about it. If it doesn't say on the door cinematographers, you're always welcome. Let me put it that way. And I hope you're going to enjoy this quick video. Thank you so much for joining in. You know, uh, uh, Ian and Marcello are going to post links to this build to all our factory drivers on Discord. If you're on Discord, just ask them, they will give it to you. Um, and for everybody else, we are going to push it, I hope, as soon as next week, live with tons of more training courses and interesting stuff that you can do where I'm going to cover into more details these features and, you know, help you really see, uh, you know, see how you can best do it. Thank you all, everybody, and enjoy another few minutes with Kyle Kelly, our factory. Hi, my name's Kyle Kelly. I'm a cinematographer and colorist in New York. As a cinematographer first, for years I approached the color process as something completely separate from production, a tool for post to fix errors and build a look after the fact. It wasn't until recently that I learned just how backwards that approach really was. Now, before digital capture became the norm, a DP would test various film stocks and processing methods, dialing in the look they wanted before principal production. Through testing, they'd know just how far they could push a particular stock, under what conditions it would perform best, and under which it would break. These tests were and still are crucial. In order to capture the best image in camera, a cinematographer needs to know what they will get from a specific stock and lab process. The same is true for digital, and it's perhaps even more critical. Though grading in a digital environment allows for far more flexibility than using a chemical process, that doesn't mean that we need to start from scratch. If I know the color palette of a film relies on a contrast between cool shadows and warm highlights, why wait until post-production to see what that actually looks like? It's worth noting that we're always shooting with a LUT, whether or not it's one you created. Though you may be capturing a log image in a raw format, you're still always monitoring that via some sort of LUT, whether it's one provided by the manufacturer or one created by yourself or another colorist. If you build a custom show LUT beforehand and use that to monitor on set, you'll be able to make more informed decisions in concert with your director and production designer to set yourself up for success in the final grade. I'm going to show you how Look Designer allows you to build custom LUTs that you can then use to monitor on set. With the cinematographer, DIT, and colorist all on the same page, a simple CDL should be able to get you close to the final image before you even enter the grading suite. The footage that I'll be using for this demonstration was provided by Nicholas Santos. It's from his film, It Cuts Deep, which is uh, an independent horror comedy that I shot um, a year or two ago that was just released this year. 
Um, I did, was not the original colorist on the project. The original colorist was Nicholas Leroux, and the footage you're seeing right now in the trailer was his work. Uh, so thank you both Nick Santos and Nick Leroux for uh, allowing me to play around with this stuff. Okay, so it seems like it's obvious why it would be useful to have the LUT that you're going to be using in post available to you in camera even if you're going to make large adjustments. Um, and so why is that? Well, so what I'm playing right now is some footage from the film, It Cuts Deep, with the IPP2 medium roll-off LUT as provided by RED. So this is a LUT that is available in camera and that you can also apply as, as sort of a base point in post. Um, you can see that it differs from the uh, raw setting, so it's not just a Rec. 709 LUT, right? So this this 709 versus this 709, there's something's different, right? This is part of the problem with RED is that there's multiple different versions of their uh, standard quote-unquote 709 LUT. And you can see here that it, you know your contrast is different, highlight roll-off is different, so you don't actually know what you're getting. And then, although again, this is not the look of the actual film. This is something I just created for an example say this is what we were actually going for. Obviously this is incredibly different from this, right? It's just a completely different looking image. Now, of course, this is something that can be done in post. I did this completely in post myself. But if this is the look that you're going for, it makes a lot more sense to just have this available in camera to monitor. Uh, you know, obviously you want to have a calibrated monitor so you're looking at accurate scopes and you're looking at an accurate image. But you can imagine that having this on set would, would yield a completely different result. If I'm lighting to this and I'm exposing to this, I can see that there's all this information here because I've, you know, lowered my contrast and my highlight roll-off is a lot less intense than here. I mean, granted, this information is all there. So, you know, as I drop down my my ISO is here if I were to drop that way down. It's clearly there is the information there, so it's not really a concern. But it might have led me to, you know, push the exposure further. Who knows? Um, also, you know, you think about if you're working with uh, your production designer and your director and they're looking at the frame and they say, you know, this is your palette you're eventually going for, this sort of contrast of, of cool and warm tones and they see this image, they'll probably say, okay, great, That's that looks like what we're going for. Whereas if they see this image, they will probably say, huh, that's a lot warmer than I thought we were gonna end up with. And you say, oh, no, 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 don't worry, we're gonna cool it down in post, we're gonna cool it down in post. Well, that <laughs> can only get you so far, and it's, uh, it also means you're giving up the control of the image to someone else rather than really working to develop it ahead of time. So with that example out of the way, I just want to, sh you know, actually walk through how a look designer can be used to, um, to build a look. So, you know, you just apply your look designer as you would any o OFX plugin. And the first thing you want to do is you want to kind of come up to your input profile and select the camera you're working with. There, you know, every update seems to be adding new cameras, but um, most of the major ones are here. So I'll start with my red IPP2, since that's what this was it, what this was shot in, um, and that's just bringing it to a Rec. 709. Um, the next thing that I generally do, we'll come back to all these op options at the top afterwards. But the next thing that I generally do is come down to my negative options. So, you know, these you don't have to use. You can build a luck LUT using other options as well, but I find that these can yield something really interesting. Um, so I'll start with a negative stock. You also have the option of these minor and major options. You can go through all of them and find there's you know a ton of different ton of different choices here. But um, just for the sake of example, I'm going to use Vision 350D. It's a pretty standard stock, and you know this is a pretty brightly lit. Um, daylight scene, so I'll use the 50D for that. You can adjust your negative intensity. You can see as it's going up and down what it's doing to the to the image. I'll probably start somewhere around here. Um, and then you can select your contrast curve. So again, there's several options here. 
Um, I'm gonna start with something relatively low contrast. I like this, this F5 look. And then again, you can adjust your contrast intensity. Um, again, I'm gonna stick around somewhere here for now. And then if you'd like, you can also select a print stock. And so, you know, part of the thing that gives film its distinctive look is not just the original negative stock that it's captured on, but then the stock that it's printed on. Um, and that the combination of those two factors are a big part of what gives it its look. Again, you have the opportunity here to adjust the print intensity. Um, and then usually, often with these combination of factors, you're gonna end up with something relatively high saturation. So I end up dropping the saturation a little bit before I do much else. Um, so there already you're starting to get something that is just a good baseline for an image. So where the real magic of this uh, look designer comes in, I think, is really in the subtractive color science. So subtractive color is a you know concept that comes from film, and really it's just a different tool set. So you know you could really probably accomplish the same things that I'm going to be getting here through your lift gamma gain controls, but it's just a different tool set, and I find it can really yield interesting results. So um, before I even uh, deal with the individual controls just to show you what it happens if I increase everything. As you can see it's darkening the image slightly and it's also um, increasing saturation so so as you're doing this if you've already dialed in your exposure you may want to adjust your push and pull to uh, compensate. So I'll reset those. I'm just going to push in a bit more cyan here, a bit more yellow, see it's really starting to push into those highlights. Give it a tiny bit of magenta and then a little bit more cyan. Okay, and then I'm going to push this up a little bit. You also have temperature control here. You know, if you really want to go one way or the other. I find that this is generally something that I would do on a per shot basis, but you know, if you want to make a global change, you can. Um, and then you've got some lift gamma gain controls as well. And I'm just going to dial this back a little bit. So, you know, so now we have like a decent starting point for if this is where we, if, if this is the LUT, say this is what we like, who knows? It's something I did in five seconds. So <laughs> you probably want to take a little bit more time and actually be basing it off of references and in conversation with your director, et cetera, et cetera. But now you've got this look and this LUT and you can apply this to your other shots or you can export it. So it's as simple as just clicking your export LUT 33 or 65 depending on if you're going for use in camera or on a monitor or for uh, use within DaVinci. And that's basically it. So, you know, as you can see, you can really create something entirely different that then can be applied to your various shots. So I want to show you one more example. So this was, you know, a simple back and forth scene at a diner. You can see there's a lot of red pollution here. Uh, there's sort of like a magenta haze. Um, and very quickly, uh, by applying the same LUT I created earlier, you end up with something just not only cleaner looking, but, I, you know, arguably more filmic. I know that's a pretty general term. Um, but I think it would be pretty easy to argue that that is a better looking image than that. Um, and even if it weren't better looking, if this is actually the colors that I'm going for, this, you know, these like darker blues, um, contrasting with the warm skin tones, as opposed to this sort of wash of warmth. So not only will you have an easier time lighting on the day, an easier time actually assessing what you're working with on the day and making sure your director, production designer, producers, etc. are happy. When you get to post, you'll be closer to the final image. If you've got the LUT that you're going to end up using as your show LUT, you can apply it in camera and then when you're looking at your dailies, create a little CDL and then when you get to post, maybe all you need to do is add a little vignette. This one's a little intense so I'd probably dial that back, but Let's say here, if I copy that one, there you go. So maybe I just, you know, bring in this vignette and all of a sudden you've got a pretty nice image. I'd probably actually dial that back a little bit. Uh, soften it up, maybe make it a little larger, but you get the picture. This versus this. 
This is direct from camera. This is also direct from camera. And look how much closer to the final you get. And that's just simply adding a vignette without even a CDL. I think you'll find that if you really learn how to use this tool, it'll become an incredibly useful part of your onset workflow that carries over into your post-production workflow. 